We are now going to talk about Alfred's daughter, Ethelfled, Lady of the Mercians. Now, she was what we might like to think of in our age as a warrior queen, and you'll find her referred to as a warrior queen in popular culture and um, in certain literature, but she was so much more than that. Yes, she was a warrior and a military leader. She was also a great tactician, and she was a bit of a public relations expert as well. Her public relations expertise is shown by this portrayal of her by Henry of Huntingdon, written in the 12th century. And remember, Henry of Huntingdon was the guy that gave us the story of King Canute trying to turn back the tide. So he writes of her, heroic elf lady, great in martial fame, a man in valour, woman though in name. The warlike hosts, the nature too obeyed, conqueror o'er both, though born by sex a maid. Changed be thy name, such honour triumphs bring, a queen by title, but in deeds a king. Heroes before the Mercian heroine quailed, Caesar himself to win such glory failed. So she's really being bigged up here as the warrior queen. And it's basically saying she was so good in battle and in valour that she might as well have been a man. Obviously doesn't sit very well with us um, to our modern ears. But it reinforces that in the medieval period... This was a very unusual thing to have a woman who was a military leader and followed by men was something that was not common. Here is another description of uh, Ethelfled from William of Malmesbury, who was an Anglo-Norman chronicler. So no real need to be kind about the Anglo-Saxons, but he wrote that she was a powerful accession to Edward's party, her brother's reign. The delight of his subjects, the dread of his enemies, a woman of enlarged soul. So she's the dread of his enemies. This idea of her being fearsome in battle here, you see her depicted with swords and spears, is, is a very common image of her, but also that she had an enlarged soul, that she was a spiritual woman. And that was something that was very much venerated in the medieval period. So as the daughter of Alfred the Great, Ethelfled had been born into the royal house of Wessex and in Wessex, royal women were not allowed a political role. Aylesworth, Ethelfled's mother, hadn't been given the title of queen and she never witnessed charters, unlike her daughter in Mercia. So in Mercia, Alfred's sister Ethelswith had married King Burgred and she was actually recognised as queen there and she was able to witness charters and she made land grants jointly with her husband. So there was a different culture there and women were able to hold more power. We should really look at Mercia and I've written here English Mercia, the part of Mercia under Anglo-Saxon control because at that point in history some of it belonged to the Vikings but under the Anglo-Saxon control was Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Herefordshire and Shropshire. So that was the part of the world that Ethelfled ended up ruling. Now, she lived from 870 until the 12th of June 918 and she ruled Mercia alone after her husband died um, from about 911 until her death and the title she had was Merkna Clyde, Lady of the Mercians. She was, of course, the daughter of Alfred the Great and Aylesworth, and she was wife of Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians. Now, Ethelred became Lord of the Mercians after Caelwulf, who we've talked about previously, the puppet king controlled by the Vikings, was deposed and his lands carved up. And we don't know an awful lot about Ethelred or his lineage or where he sprang up from. He may have been a bit of an opportunist, according to some historians, but he becomes Lord of the Mercians, although he acknowledges Alfred as his overlord. So Ethelfled, as we've mentioned before, is very much known for her military expertise, her support of the church, and also the support of her brother, Edward the Elder's regime in Wessex. So he's ruling Wessex, she's ruling Mercia. They are a family to be reckoned with. So let's talk a little bit about Mercia after Alfred. And we know that Alfred was actually King of Wessex, but his life and times had some impact on Mercia as well, as we've seen. So after Alfred's victory at Eddington in 878, the part of Mercia that was under Anglo-Saxon rather than Viking control came under Ethelred's rule. Ethelred 
began to rule Mercia after Caelwulf was deposed. And we don't really know an awful lot about Ethelred, what his ancestry was, where he came from, why he had a right to rule. He's, he's a bit of an enigmatic figure in that way. But he accepted Alfred as overlord. So Alfred cemented relations with Mercia and with Ethelred by marrying him to Ethelfled in the 880s. And Ethelred was actually a lot older than Ethelfled. Imagine that. That's such a power couple name, isn't it? Ethelred and Ethelfled. Like, pass the pork, Ethelfled. Certainly will. Do you want the sauce, Ethelred? Quite a conversation there, but I digress. So Ethelred and Edward fought renewed Viking attacks in the 890s. And Ethelfled and Ethelred together fortified Worcester. And they also financially supported Mercian churches and built an abbey at Gloucestershire. So being part of the fight against the Vikings and getting in with the church, a big feature of their joint reign. Ethelred's health, though, began to decline and, and it's possible that Ethelfled was the de facto ruler of Mercia from about 902. So Edward the Elder succeeded Alfred in 899 and 10 years later in 909 sent a West Saxon and Mercian force to raid the northern Danelaw. They returned with the remains of the Northumbrian Saint Oswald, who Ethelfled had interred in the new minster at Gloucester, which she and her husband had built. Now this was a public relations triumph because St. Oswald was one of the founders of Anglo-Saxon Christianity and remember the church was a very powerful force in Anglo-Saxon society. Also he was a royal saint so this association is very good for Ethelfled and Ethelred. So Ethelfled and Ethelred raised Edward's son and heir Ethelstan in their court and Ethelstan was actually sent to them by Alfred so that he could be well educated and chroniclers at the time commented that he was very well educated at Ethelfled and Ethelred's court. You can see Ethelstan's tomb to the bottom right. I know that seems a little macabre but by looking at the tomb statue we can get a fair idea of what he might have actually looked like. So Ethelred eventually died in 911 and Ethelfled became the official ruler of Mercia, the Lady of the Mercians. And the accession of a female ruler is described by the historian Ian Walker as one of the most unique events in early medieval history. We don't have an awful lot of female rulers that we know of from that time. And um, actually, Ethelfled passed the throne on to her daughter Elfwina when she died. We're going to hear a little bit about that in a moment. So when Ethelred died, Edward took control of London and Oxford. Quite major habitations but Ethelfled probably conceded to this in return for recognition as the ruler of Mercia. So we have the sister ruling Mercia and the brother ruling Wessex. This is the Anglo-Saxon Parr family. Ethelfled, as we mentioned, passed the throne to her daughter Elfwyn who actually only reigned from June to December 918 before being deposed by her uncle, Edward the Elder, who actually carried her off to Wessex. And we are not completely sure, but it seems quite likely that she entered holy orders and spent the rest of her life as a nun. So Frank Stenton, the historian, has commented of Ethelfled, that it was through reliance of, on her guardianship of Mercia that her brother was enabled to begin the forward movement against the Southern Danes that was the outstanding feature of his reign. He needed her where she was. Um, he obviously didn't have the same kind of relationship or place the same kind of faith in Elfwyn. So let's talk about Ethelfled and Ethelred's relationship with the church, which was going to be a very important factor in the reign of an early medieval power couple. So Ethelfled and Ethelred granted the church at Worcester a half share of the rights of lordship, which meant that the church got a half share of the land rents and from the money that people had paid into the justice system, for example. So in return, the cathedral was to dedicate a psalm to them three times daily and a mass and 30 psalms on Saturdays. Now, that might sound a bit strange to modern sensibility, and perhaps we might have a tendency to say, well, 
they must have done this for some kind of spiritual reason, believing that it got them closer to heaven. And that may be true, but it was also a public relations triumph, another public relations triumph in that, you know, there wasn't Facebook in those days. So how did you stay in people's minds? How did you stay in the public consciousness? How did you come across as saintly and a benefactor of the city? Well, this is how you did it. And we've mentioned before that Ethel Fled is really a talented PR woman. In 904, Bishop Werfrith Worcester gave Ethelfled and Ethelred valuable land, which included land on the city's river frontage, which they were able to monetize pretty well. So they were able to dominate the city politically and also profit from it. Ethelfled, as we mentioned before, is famous as a warrior queen and for her military rule. So let's look at that in a bit more depth. She's described in some documents as having led expeditions which she planned. So she doesn't just send people out to do her work. She is um, recorded as actually having been present at some battles. And you'll quite often see her depicted with a sword in her hand. How much she got involved in the nitty gritty of actually fighting people, I would say, is questionable. But in 902, the Vikings were expelled from Dublin and made a failed attempt to attack Wales when they left Ireland. So they then asked Ethelfled for permission to settle near Chester. She agreed and for a time there was peace. But then the Norse Vikings joined the Danes to attack Chester. But Ethelfled, being no fool, had already fortified it, not having completely trusted them. She and Ethelred convinced the Irish who were fighting alongside the Vikings to change sides. So Ethelfled after this refounded Chester as a burr. She learned a lot from her father's military thinking and she's believed to have enhanced its Roman defences with new walls that ran to the River Dee. So she's following the pattern set for her by Alfred the Great. In the 910s, Ethelfled and her brother Edward extended Alfred's network of burrs. They had seen that that was the effective way to fight the Vikings. And in 912, she built defences at Bridge North to cover a crossing of the River Severn. So again, her father's thinking of we have to block the rivers is coming through. In 913, she built forts at Tamworth and Stafford to guard against the Danes. So she's, she's very strategic in the places that she chooses to fortify. And in 914, she raised a Mercian army from Gloucestershire and Hereford and repelled a Viking invasion. Edisbury Hill Fort, which was an Iron Age fort, was repaired to protect against a Viking invasion that might come via Northumbria or Cheshire. And Warwick was fortified against the Danes at Leicester, so she's protecting her kingdom on every side. In 917, Ethelfled sent an army to capture Derby, and that was the first of the five boroughs of the Dane law to fall to the Anglo-Saxons. And this was a military triumph for Ethelfled, um, for which she is still remembered. In 918, the Danes in Leicester surrendered without a fight. And um, the Vikings in York also surrendered to her, possibly to secure her support against the Norse Vikings. Um, but she died before she could receive their oaths of fealty. Let's talk about the death and burial of Ethelfled. And even in her death, she's thinking about public relations. So Ethelfled died on the 12th of June, 918 at Tamworth. Um, not exactly sure what her cause of death was, but her body was carried for 75 miles where she was buried alongside her husband at St. Oswald's Minster in Gloucester, which they had had built. So she was buried near the bones of the saint. And as we've mentioned before, he was a very important saint associated with the birth of Christianity in England and also with royalty. So this made her an important queen to be lying near the, the bones of a saint. Gloucester was also close to Wessex emphasising her descent from Alfred the Great and the Royal House of Wessex. But it is not a land over which her brother had sway, so she's not subordinate to anybody. She is the Queen. She was succeeded, as we said before, by her daughter Elfwyn, who only reigned until December and was deposed by Edward the 
elder. That then united Wessex and Mercia. But the people of Mercia were not completely supportive of the Union. Um, and there was actually a Mercian version of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle around the time. So they're trying to keep a sort of unique culture going. Let's talk about depiction in history. Here she is pictured from the BBC TV programme The Last Kingdom, which I'm going to admit I've only seen the first two episodes of so far, so I can't really comment on how they depict Ethelfled, but um, the BBC did do a brilliant programme recently called The Children of Alfred the Great. Um, I'm not sure if it's still on iPlayer, you might catch it on YouTube, but I'll try and see if I can find a link to it because it really was very good. Anyway, Ethelfled is hardly mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Some historians argue that that's because Edward didn't want to encourage Mercian separatism by venerating the achievements of his sister. There is a Mercian equivalent to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which I mentioned before, and that's where we get most of our records of her reign. The Annals of Ulster, and this is an Ulster accent speaking to you at the moment, Northern Ireland, but the Annals of Ulster call her Famosissima Regina Saxones, the most renowned Saxon queen. 